Sidebar is brought to you by Monterey College of Law, San Luis Obispo College of Law, Kern County College of Law, Empire College of Law located in Santa Rosa, and the Colleges of Law with campuses in Santa Barbara and Ventura. Welcome to Sidebar, discussions with local, state, and national experts about protecting our most critical individual and civil rights. Co-hosts, Vladine's Jackie Gardina and Mitch Winnick. I do believe we got to somehow try to keep talking to people who disagree with us. And we're trained to do that as lawyers. Can we do it in a very persuasive way, but also a very human way with emotional intelligence that takes care of what are people's needs and interests and fears? And how can we address that and maybe find some common ground together? That's our guest, Lisa Kloppenberg, author of The Best Beloved Thing is Justice, The Life of Dorothy Wright Nelson. Mitch, I am very excited to be back on Sidebar with you today, especially because we actually have a friend who's joining us, Lisa Kloppenberg. Um, Now, just to set the stage for who Lisa is, she is really considered an academic of academics. Uh, She's had a distinguished journey in her career. She served as a law professor, a law dean, a provost, a vice president, and a president. But her job titles don't really define her contribution to higher education. At the heart of her legacy at Santa Clara University is Lisa's belief that access and affordability, as well as increased diversity, equity, and inclusion, are critical to the mission of higher education in general and legal education specifically. And Mitch, I know that's something that we share with her. We certainly do. Jackie, you and I have had the chance to work together with Lisa as a law school colleague, challenging barriers in California to access to the legal profession. Given what we know about her, I certainly wasn't surprised that Lisa chose to be the official biographer of a glass ceiling breaking and highly respected California jurist, Judge Dorothy Wright Nelson. Lisa's book, The Best Beloved Thing is Justice, The Life of Dorothy Wright Nelson, is not only a story of the first woman dean of the University of Southern California, it is a reminder of the important role that she and other women jurists in the 20th century played in transforming the federal judiciary from really what was an all-white, all-male enclave. Okay, Jackie, but let's not spoil the story. Lisa will tell it much better than we can. Lisa, welcome to Sidebar. Oh, it's such an honor to be with both of you, to be on this wonderful podcast, and uh, to be with old friends again. I admire very much the work that both of you are doing as deans and with this podcast. Well, thank you, Lisa. Lisa, in your book, you describe Dorothy Wright Nelson as an inspiration, a role model, and a source of strength. What strikes me is that this was a very personal opportunity for you to recognize someone who was clearly very important in your career and your professional decisions. Can you talk about how Judge Wright's role as a mentor helped shape your career, and perhaps equally important, why a mentor relationship is so important in developing professional character and vision? As you all know, our students are so much more diverse today than when we were in law school. And so it's really important to try to find them mentors who look like them. You don't always have to have a mentor who looks like you. I've had great white male mentors. On the other hand, I think it helps our students to see a variety of mentors. So I was really lucky. I never had met a lawyer until I had a First Amendment class in my senior year of college at USC. And after a while, he'd seen my writing and and work. And he said, Lisa, you should think about going to law school. I had never thought of that. So I had no lawyer mentors or really even female professional role models, except a few high school teachers, very few female teachers at university in the early 80s. So I was very fortunate in my second year, I took a class on alternative dispute resolution and the administration of justice with Dorothy Wright Nelson. And by then she was on the Ninth Circuit. I didn't really know about her history. I didn't know she'd been one of the early female law professors in the country and that she'd been the first dean of a major US law school who was female. And I just didn't know all these things about her. But she really cared about you as a person. You know, were you happy? What were you 
being fulfilled in life. So after that wonderful year with her, as I went out into practice and then legal education, we stayed in touch. And so she was really influential to me. Soon after I got tenure at the University of Oregon, she called me and said, Lisa, we need more women deans in legal education. (laughs) I was kind of like laying down the gauntlet. Wait a minute. (laughs) I just got tenure. I just started this conflict resolution program at Oregon. I don't know that I want to move my family and and become a dean. So when I did become a a dean in 2001, I was the youngest law dean in the country, first female dean in Ohio. And I attribute all of that and then the work at Santa Clara in the various roles Jackie mentioned, all of that I attribute to Judge Nelson really pushing me to pave the way for other women. There's two things that you said that really stand out. One is the power of an educator to influence people's lives. And I'll start with your First Amendment USC professor who said, Lisa, you should think about being a lawyer without that little kind of push. The career that you've had would not have existed. And then Dorothy Wright Nelson steps in and and suddenly your career in the law is shaped by yet another educator. It makes my heart sing because that, I think, is what brings us all to the profession is in part to develop others to to lead the way. So I, I love that. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about that really took me by surprise in the book, uh, and I'm not sure why it surprised me, but it did, is that really a lot of work that Judge Nelson did in the legal profession were deeply influenced by her faith. And I'm not even sure I'm going to pronounce it correctly. Can you pronounce it for me? Yes. She and her husband, Judge James Nelson, on the state court, were both members of the Baha'i faith. And it's a global faith originated in what is now Iran. And basically, they were two of the nine leaders of their faith in the United States for decades, almost like running the church, you know. I think a lot of lawyers are surprised by that, Jackie, because I think we're taught or or, or we get the message somehow that your faith and your personal life is very separate. But of course, you know, we're all mind, body and spirit, right? We're very rich beings. And these things, it's hard to separate a judge from her experience or from her beliefs or maybe sometimes how she was raised. So Dorothy never proselytized. I didn't know she was a Baha'i for many years. And she would bring it into conversation sometimes, but never in a sense to try to convert people. And many of her colleagues on the Ninth Circuit, whom I interviewed, said the same thing. They didn't know for a long time that she was a Baha'i. I just want to talk for a minute about the story in the book about how she got introduced to it, because it links to that story about discrimination that you started us with. It was when a member of her law school class and the law school class had two women and one African-American. The class was invited to the legal fraternity, except for the two women and the one African-American. And there was one student who stood up and said, that's not okay. That's right. There was one white male student, Don Barrett, who said, we're not going to join that fraternity if they won't accept our other classmates. All the rest of the UCLA class of 1953 went along with him. And Dorothy had been vice president of the student body at UCLA as an undergrad. Uh, She said she ran for vice president because women could not be president then. I don't know if it was even an official rule, but that's just the way things were in the late 40s. So she knew this guy, but he was kind of a big man on campus. She thought of him as a partier. She didn't think of him as serious at all. So she was pretty shocked when he stood up for equality for women and people of color well before civil rights movement and the Montgomery boy bus boycott. So um, she asked him, what's going on, Don? Why did you do that? And he said rather hesitantly, well, I've recently become a Baha'i and they really believe that all people are created equal. Men, women, African-Americans, white, Asian, all, all people are equal. So Dorothy and her husband began attending some Baha'i meetings. They did a lot of reading and they kind of thought about it. And, and within five years, they both became Baha'is And we're very serious about it. Lisa, the story you told in the book really resonated with me personally. 
as you may know, I came from a small town in Texas. We were the only Jewish family in that town. And when I was in fifth grade, we had a Baha'i family move in. And it will not surprise you that their son was the same grade I was in. It won't surprise you that we gravitated toward each other because two of these things were not like the other. (laughs) And it gave me an opportunity at a really early age in my life to learn more about the Baha'i faith and many of the things it shared, at least with me and with my family, as far as Jewish philosophy and Jewish beliefs as well. That's right. A lot of shared values, right, among so many faiths in terms of treating people with respect and the golden rule and all of that. And in just staying on the time in which she was kind of starting her career and her family, the other thing that kind of stood out for me in following her life's journey is the parallel between her marriage and Ruth Bader Ginsburg's marriage. Both women attended law school at a time when women weren't encouraged to do so. Both women attended law school with their husbands. And it seems like both Jim Nelson and Marty Ginsburg were incredibly supportive of their wives' career paths. So how did she kind of navigate this breaking all of these glass ceilings while kind of living out the expected gender role of the 1950s? That's right. And it wasn't easy, Jackie, but she would give Jim so much credit for that. It really was a partnership. They were best friends and they met as high school camp counselors as teenagers, and they just were really best friends. Now, you know, Baha'is are members of political parties, but he leaned more Republican. She leaned more Democrat. And and they disagreed about things like the exclusionary rule and other things. They'd have apparently vivid dinner conversations that the kids remember. But they were just so close and they did everything together. The travel, um, the sharing of kid responsibilities. She did more after school while they were young and she was a faculty member because she had flexibility. But when he went from private practice to being a state court judge, he could have them in his chambers after school. Sometimes they were down with Dorothy at USC. Sometimes they were with dad in the state courts. And they both of the children were really close to their father as well. We are going to take a quick break. And when we return, we will be learning more about Judge Nelson's groundbreaking professional career chronicled in Lisa Kloppenberg's book, The Best Love Thing is Justice, The Life of Dorothy Wright Nelson. The Legal Technology Assessment, LTA, by ProCertis is a benchmark assessment and a training platform for law students and all legal professionals. Our online application establishes fluency within the most widely used tools of the trade. ProCertis is reshaping online learning. Come check us out at www.procertis.com. The Master of Arts in Law degree from the Colleges of Law was designed to empower working professionals to become innovative problem solvers in careers that intersect with the law. The legal field is more than what happens in a courtroom after all. The Colleges of Law. Learn more at collegesoflaw.edu. Welcome to the future of legal intelligence. Trellis a state trial court research and analytics solution. Trellis offers state trial court records for legal research with analysis on judges, opposing counsel, verdicts, motions, dockets, and legal issues. Visit our website, trellis.law. Lisa, one of the things I thought was fascinating that I did not know is that Judge Nelson supposedly was on the short list for the U.S. Supreme Court in 1973. Yes. After her elevation to the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, she didn't take senior status until 1995. Had she been selected to the Supreme Court in the 1970s, she likely would have served 20 years on the Supreme Court. Knowing her as you do, What changes do you think she might have brought to the court? Her number one principle was to build consensus among the the jurors. She thought it wasn't good for the public to see the justices being really mean to each other or, or judges on the Ninth Circuit. So she would really try 
to work hard to avoid a dissent. She would not have been the great dissenter, but in particular cases where really, you know, she had a heart for immigrants, for racial justice, for gender equity. She, I could see her writing some really stirring dissents, but I don't think she would have been quite like Justice Ginsburg in terms of the women's rights advocate who then went on to the court. Because Dorothy, both from her Baha'i practice of conciliation and from teaching ADR and teaching judges how to use it, she was the one that tried to get her colleagues to agree as much as possible. Sometimes that might mean a narrower opinion based on the facts of a particular case, less precedent setting. Sometimes it would just mean being careful about certain issues on which they couldn't reach an agreement among the three-judge panel. It's a fascinating story about how both her faith and her ADR training influenced her approach to the judiciary and her work on the bench. How else do you think she influenced the courts generally and the Ninth Circuit specifically? Can I tell you, Jackie, that she almost didn't go on the bench. She really had to think about it because it would be a significant decrease in salary from her work at USC and her ability to sit on corporate boards and things like that. She was tired of the fundraising, ready to step down after 14 years as dean or interim dean. And so she was really wanted to run an ADR center, which had global proportions, and and she was going to teach half time and run this center. Well, Carter's people called, and she had worked with them on getting merit selection in the federal judiciary. She'd been president of the American Judicature Society when Carter was elected, and both candidates, AJS, asked both candidates, if you're elected, would you agree to merit selection of federal judges? So this is another important thing that Dorothy helped to accomplish to make our judiciary less of a monolithic entity and really expand it in terms of family lawyers, legal academics, others who had not been traditionally thought of for the bench, including women and minorities. So anyway, Judge Jim gave Dorothy some advice. He said, you've been writing about this ADR stuff all your life. This is your chance to actually get in there and make a difference in the courts. And that's really what made a difference for her. She said those first few years, she felt like she was a kid in a sandbox. (laughs) She's in the middle of a collegial group. They get to design the rules. And last I read a couple of years ago, the Ninth Circuit employed 18 full-time mediators. I do want to switch to something that has been on my mind. I'm sure it's been on your mind and Mitch's mind, which is kind of the state of our legal profession. Judge Nelson, while she was dean at USC, was there during a very tumultuous time in American history with the civil rights movement, Vietnam War protests, and other things kind of taking shape on college campuses, and Watergate and the kind of effect on the legal profession with the number of lawyers that were implicated in the Watergate case. And then the ABA came up with, hey, you have to teach professional responsibility in law schools. Here we are 50 years later facing what I think of as another really serious crisis in the legal profession. I'm just wondering if you have any insights to how she navigated leading a law school at a time of such tumult and really guiding students into an ethical practice position. As always, she tried to lead from a point of consensus. So she'd sit down with the students. She'd sit down with the trustees who disagreed with the students, uh, the police chief. You know, she'd sit down with anybody willing to talk because <laughs> she really did believe you could find common ground. She was often embroiled at USC in battles is too strong a word, but in in, uh, controversies uh, with some of the more conservative trustees. And she was the only woman dean. It was really early to be a female dean. So some of them were skeptical anyway, but then they heard she was, you know, admitting more women and people of color, and they were starting these things called legal clinics. There was a lot of skepticism. I loved her approach there. And it was a great lesson for me as a leader She just invited the primary critic in to the law school and she toured him around, showed him the clinics, introduced him to the students. He really learned. She learned about his concerns and he ended up getting her on the board of major company in Southern California 
which ended up giving a lot of scholarships to USC law for years. So that, you know, she isn't afraid of conflict. She really believes you can sit, sit down and resolve almost everything. She never was fatigued. She was always persistent, always diplomatic, but she was going to pursue a justice issue no matter who came after her. So let me just follow up on that, because along those lines, particularly what we're seeing in Florida right now, where we have the government in the, the light of the governor and their legislature stepping in and inserting themselves in academia, removing presidents. I mean, they most likely would have stepped in and fired her if she had worked for a state university in Florida last month. What can we learn from her approach? I mean, I like the hopeful thought. It warms my heart to hear how she did it. But I am just fearful that that's not the stage we're in right now. What what can we learn from then to perhaps help us through now? Yes, it's interesting. I do think we're in different times now. And so it may be even harder to be as persistent and passionate about that. But I'll give you an extreme example. Probably one of the most difficult uh, controversies she faced is that one of the clinics they'd created with UCLA and Loyola Law School ended up suing the chief of police and the LAPD for the way that they handcuffed and treated suspects of color, particularly the young Black and Hispanic men they encountered in L.A. Dorothy didn't choose to sue them. You know, that was the decision of the teacher who ran the clinic, the professor, who eventually became a well-regarded federal district court judge in Los Angeles, Terry Hatter. But Terry Hatter was the professor, and they sued because they thought it was the right thing to do. And the chief of police got really upset. Others got involved so that they threatened to withdraw security for USC as a campus. And USC, we all need our security officers, right? And SC didn't have its own private security then. LAPD took care of things. Dorothy and Terry Hatter were called into a meeting with the president, and it was clear the president wanted them to drop the lawsuit. And she refused to do that. She said, no, I would have sat down and tried to mediate a compromise. That would have been my approach, but I'm gonna stand behind this litigation from my faculty. And so eventually, and she also went then and had a meeting with the chief of police at a restaurant in Los Angeles. And I think a student heard about it because his dad was uh, a manager at the restaurant or something. And um, the next day in the student paper, you know, she was labeled a fascist for meeting with the chief of police. So the board was calling her a communist. Students were calling her a fascist. And she's right in the middle of things. But again, she kind of would put all that in perspective and say, what's the main point here? We're really trying to advance racial justice. How do we need to do that? Who do we need to get on board? And that's the only hopeful thing I can say, Mitch, and and I don't live in Florida or a state that's, that's really been like that with education, but I do believe we got to somehow try to keep talking to people who disagree with us. And we're trained to do that as lawyers. Can we do it in a very persuasive way, but also a very human way with emotional intelligence that takes care of what are people's needs and interests and fears? And how can we address that and maybe make some, find some common ground together? Just staying on kind of that, her passion, it's clear just based on her research and her writing, the biography, as well as her own life that she lived, that she held the judiciary and kind of the judges to the highest ethical standards. So what advice do you think she would give Chief Judge Roberts about kind of developing a code of ethics and resolving the issues to kind of maintain the legitimacy of the judiciary. I think you're right, Jackie, that that is an issue she really cared about. Respect for the rule of law, respect for the judiciary. That's partly why she worked so hard at consensus, because she didn't want the public to see the, any infighting among the judges. I think she would very much support ethical codes. You know, why should judges be held to any different standards than lawyers? We're going to take a brief break to hear from our sponsors and then continue our conversation with Lisa Kloppenberg 
about her book about the incomparable Judge Dorothy Wright Nelson and how we continue to work towards equity within the legal profession. Kaplan helps thousands of law students become lawyers every year. Prepare to pass your bar exam with personalized prep that fits how you learn best. Choose from a traditional two-month course, a flexible three-month course, or semester-long prep. And get your personalized study plan, which includes thousands of realistic questions and unlimited essay grading. No one does bar review like Kaplan. Find the bar review that fits you best so you can score your best. Visit captest.com slash bar. That's K-A-P-Test.com slash bar. Jackie and I would like to take a quick minute to recommend a great podcast. An Honorable Profession profiles the rising stars in American politics. From mayors to attorney generals, An Honorable Profession gives listeners a view from the front lines of our democracy. Check out An Honorable Profession wherever podcasts are found. San Luis Obispo College of Law offers on-site and hybrid online evening classes that provide you the option to continue working while attending law school. To learn more about their accredited degree programs or to apply for their next term, go to slowlaw.org. That's S-L-O law.org. Your community, your law school, your future. We recently had Professor Julie Souk on Sidebar discussing her book, After Misogyny, How the Law Fails Women and What to Do About It. Your career and Judge Wright's careers are highlights about how women can overcome the historical and, as Professor Souk points out, ongoing patriarchal bias in the legal profession. As a role model and mentor, what guidance do you provide to the next generation of women lawyer and judges? And, and perhaps equally important, how do you convey those messages to their future male colleagues in a way that might influence their professional behavior? I do think we have to teach history. You know, we have to teach what our foremothers went through. For example, in my professional responsibility class, we didn't only talk about Dorothy Wright Nelson in the 50s through 80s and how it was to be the only female dean of an ABA law school for five years of her tenure. Can you imagine? and walk into the room being the only one of your race or gender or identity. I also talked about my own experiences and we got the students talking about their experiences in a very kind of confidential setting, but where I think that's a great way to educate everybody. We don't all share the same experience, but if you can have respectful conversation about what others have experienced, it might make you think, how do you want to behave as a lawyer? The other thing I really emphasize for women in these difficult positions is finding a mentor. And it might be a mentor who looks different than you, but find mentors with whom you can confide, from whom you can learn. Dorothy would have never gotten into legal education if Roscoe Pound, formerly of Harvard, hadn't come out and taught her at UCLA and taken her under her wing and helped her get her first job. I just think that's really important because the issues we face are very similar. Uh, they haven't changed that much. <laughs> and, and we really need to support each other if we're going to see the change we want in the world. I love that, Lisa. And you ended where we started this conversation with the importance of mentors and the huge difference they can make, often without even realizing it. It was a joy to learn about Judge Nelson and to learn about how she shaped legal education, the judiciary, and countless students' lives. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it really was my honor, Mitch and Jackie. You know, Judge Nelson would be so thrilled. I'm, I'm honored you read the book. And I think her story, even though it happened a, a while ago, she's now 95, you know, it still has lessons that ring true for us today for law students, for leaders in legal education and the profession and the judiciary. So thank you for calling attention to her life and legacy. Absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. It was a pleasure to have you today. You're very welcome, guys. It was fun. Jackie, this was a great opportunity to visit with our friend and colleague, Lisa Kloppenberg. I am so impressed with her career, even before we get to the discussion of Judge Nelson. Lisa is a model of breaking 
glass ceilings herself in legal academia, which was, was really good to get back in touch with her. Her book about Judge Nelson, I found inspirational, primarily because we've had to spend so much time in recent months talking about things that are problematic in the legal system and the judicial system. And I just found it a a breath of fresh air to remind us that a sincere, intelligent, dedicated, as she said, persistent jurist with the caliber of Judge Nelson really can make an impact on the system. And it left me saying, I'm sorry she's 95. I wish she was still on the bench and active. Yeah, I agree, Mitch. I think one of the themes that came through that we've heard before is, especially in this day and age, is the importance of talking to each other. I think Joel Rogers talked about that. David Pepper talked about that. Charles J. talked about that. It's very much her persona and how she navigated such an incredibly challenging time to be an administrator at a college campus, to listen to some of the things that she had to work around, being called a communist by the board of trustees, followed by a fascist by the students, and still managing to walk uh, among all that and and manage it is is just absolutely inspirational to me. It's what I would aspire to be uh, if I were my best self. And Jackie, you also are a leader in this next generation of women deans who who stand on those shoulders and take it forward, both not only in the area of bringing those elements of, of fairness, discussion, and integrity into academia, but you serve as a role model and a mentor of the next generations of both men and women who want to enter the legal profession. Thank you, Mitch. If I can do a smidgen of what Judge Nelson accomplished in her life, I'll feel pretty good. Before we end, Mitch and I want to wish Judge Nelson a happy birthday. Thank you for all you have done for the legal profession, legal education, and justice here in abroad, Judge Nelson. Once again, I want to thank everyone who joined us today on Sidebar. And as always, Mitch and I would love to know what's on your mind. You can reach us at sidebarmedia.org. Sidebar would not be possible without our producer, David Eakin, who also composes and performs all of the Sidebar music. Thank you also to GoGo Zoger, who manages Sidebar's marketing and social media. Colleges of Law and Monterey College of Law are part of a larger organization called California Accredited Law Schools. All of our schools are dedicated to providing access and opportunity to a legal education to marginalized communities. For more information about the California Accredited Law Schools, go to calawschools.org. That's calawschools.org.